This video is sponsored by NordVPN. A VPN or virtual private network allows you to securely and safely use the internet, and with over 5,600 Nord servers in 59 countries, you'll find a server near you delivering great bandwidth speeds. With NordVPN you can open up a world of new content from all around the globe that may have been previously locked to you. Simply open the map, click on a location and you'll be connected to the internet via that region in seconds. TV series and films only available to stream in certain regions are now at your fingertips. Use the new Threat Protection feature to protect against malware, even when you're not connected to a VPN. When watching YouTube from a public Wi-Fi, with NordVPN you can secure against man-in-the-middle attacks, where what you believe was a public Wi-Fi is actually an imposter accessing your data. It's reassuring to me personally that NordVPN can provide my YouTube channels with that added layer of security. If you'd like to support the Operations Room and make use of their fantastic services, please visit nordvpn.com forward slash opsroom or use coupon code opsroom to get an exclusive deal with four bonus months and a 30 day guarantee. That's coupon code opsroom or nordvpn.com forward slash opsroom for four bonus months and a 30 day guarantee. As dusk falls on the 20th of December 1944, Private Lewis Simpson of the 101st Airborne is running a message to his battalion headquarters. Amid a light snowfall, Simpson comes across a Sherman tank guarding the road leading north into Bastogne. Fifty yards down the road is a burning Panzer IV. Simpson walks up to the tank where a sergeant is casually sitting on the turret as though it is a horse saddle. What happened? The exhausted sergeant looks back at the burning German tank with a bored expression and simply responds, Oh, they tried to get through. The defensive line around Bastogne is so thin that enemy tanks and infantry routinely probe the perimeter searching for weak points. Simpson can't help but wonder if his battalion would have been cut off had it not been for the casual sergeant who had fired first. Bastogne is surrounded. The siege is a nightmare for the soldiers trapped in the strategically vital town. German mortars continually shell the defenders during the night, and their snipers keep the paratroopers' heads down during the day. The constant threat of death drives men to the breaking point, and many of them will soon need to be pulled off the line. Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment is defending the northeastern approaches to the town. Already short of winter clothing, the men are plagued by frostbite and inadequate shelter. The winter of 44 is the coldest in Europe for 30 years. Captain Dick Winters will later estimate that one third of his non-combat casualties during the Battle of the Bulge will come from frostbite alone. Paratrooper Robert M. Bowen describes the conditions within the pocket. A biting wind blew over the chilling snow, piercing our inadequate clothing like a knife. We were hungry, cold and depressed. Hungry because we had been living off one or two K rations a day for nearly a week. Cold because many of us did not have overcoats, overshoes, gloves or mufflers. And depressed because after fighting debilitating campaigns in Normandy and Holland with high casualty rates, this one in Belgium threatened to be the last straw to push us over the edge. Corporal Shifty Powers of Easy Company is one of the men who has broken. Second Lieutenant Edward Shames is going on a patrol and orders Powers, the best soldier in 3rd platoon, to accompany him. OK Shifty, let's go. Sir, I can't go, I cannot go. What the hell do you mean? That's a court-martial offence. Do what you want with me. Shames can see in Powers' eyes that he is not moving no matter what. The young man has been an outstanding and obedient soldier since the start of the war, but the siege along with months of combat have finally defeated him. He is not willing to risk his life on a routine patrol. Shames has full authority to court-martial powers, but instead takes a different route. Corporal, rest up, I'll see you when we get back. Lieutenant Shames's compassion approach works. Powers recovers and is back on the line within a day. The civilian population in and around Bastogne is suffering as well. There had not been enough time to evacuate the more than 4,000 inhabitants of the area to safety before the town was cut off. German artillery fire has destroyed more than half of the habitable buildings, leaving Belgian civilians to huddle together in cellars for warmth. 101st Airborne medics do the best they can to take care of the sick, but the bulk of their attention is needed for incoming battle casualties. In most cases, the civilians must fend for themselves. Despite the danger to their lives, two civilian nurses from Bastogne, René Le Maire and Augusta Chewy, volunteer at the 20th Armoured Infantry Battalion Aid Station 
to treat wounded men. On Christmas Eve, a Luftwaffe bomb strikes the aid station, killing 30 men along with Le Maire. Chewy survives the war, and both women are remembered today as the Angels of Bastogne. General Heinz Kokot commands the German forces surrounding Bastogne, and is ordered by his superior General Lutwitz to destroy the pocket by Christmas Day. Kokot launches a concentric attack on the entire perimeter on the 22nd of December. In many places, the Germans capture roads or villages only to be surprised by tenacious American counterattacks and are pushed back. General Lutwitz is impatient to end the siege and decides to bluff the Americans to surrender. At midday on the 22nd of December, an ultimatum is submitted to his American counterparts. Surrender within the next two hours or be destroyed. The message is passed on to Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, who simply exclaims, Oh, nuts! To the joy of his men, this informal muttering is formally relayed to the German representatives who are understandably confused. McAuliffe's subordinate explains, It means go to hell, and I'll tell you something else. If you continue to attack, we will kill every goddamn German that tries to break into this town. The German delegation salutes and leaves in a hurry. The story of McAuliffe's defiant refusal raises morale considerably within the pocket. Meanwhile, on the northern shoulder of the campaign, the once vaunted Kampfgruppe Piper is about to meet its end in the village of Laglies. By the 22nd of December, Piper's force is surrounded and his King Tigers are running out of fuel. A Luftwaffe airdrop is attempted in the morning, but the poor weather along with constricted drop zones means only 10% of the supplies can be recovered. With no fuel and no rescue mission incoming, Piper decides his men will have to break out on their own on foot. They prepare their vehicles for destruction and await the order to retreat. To the south of Bastogne, General George Patton has pulled off a logistical miracle in moving the bulk of his army forward and ready to assault the German line within 48 hours, but the uncooperative snow and fog continues to blanket the battlefield. Exacerbated by similar weather frustrating his advance further south in the line in the weeks prior, Patton distributes a prayer written by his chaplain to the men on the night of the 22nd of December. It reads in part, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. His request for divine intervention appears to work. The following day, men across the Ardennes wake up to crystal clear skies. Patton writes Chaplain O'Neill up for a bronze star, while Allied air controllers across Western Europe scramble every aircraft that can fly. They all receive the same weather report, visibility unlimited. The top priority is to keep the defenders of Bastogne fighting. At just before 10am, two C-47s drop Pathfinder troops with radio beacons to identify the best drop zones for a massive resupply mission. Soon after, German observers spot an armada of 241 transport aircraft and 82 P-47 Thunderbolts flying east towards Bastogne. They radio their position so the Luftwaffe can scramble fighters to intercept. When the waves of C-47s arrive over Bastogne, they are greeted by German anti-aircraft fire. Seven transports are shot down, but the rest of the pilots bring their aircraft down to 500 feet and fly towards flares which indicate the drop zones. Once they are over their targets, the crews shove bundles of supplies out the door. The men on the ground cheer loudly in their foxholes once they see parachutes open and drift towards their positions. A paratrooper later remarked, Watching those bundles of supplies and ammunition drop was a sight to behold. We were cheering them wildly as if at a Super Bowl or World Series game. Luftwaffe squadrons of BF 109s and FW 190s attempt to disrupt the mission, but the German fighters are overwhelmed by the escorting P 47s. Most are shot down or driven off before they can make a pass at the transports. The resupply mission is a success. American logistical officers are able to recover 95% of the 334 tons of ammunition, food and medical supplies dropped to the 101st Airborne and 10th Armored Divisions. It is more than enough to keep the Americans in Bastogne in the fight. With their task completed, the C-47s head for home while the 82 escorts loiter above Bastogne for the next part of the operation. The P-47s circle and pick out ground targets 
in some cases following tank tracks in the snow right to concealed panzer companies. The Thunderbolts then unleash a hurricane of rocket and cannon fire on German positions. German AA positions can do nothing as the American fighter bombers rake artillery positions and ammunition dumps with accurate fire. Despite the best effort of Allied air controllers and flares marking friendly positions, some P-47s accidentally attack US troops. In one case, angry paratroopers fire back at the friendly aircraft. The pilot believes he has found an enemy machine gun nest and calls for other Thunderbolts to make gun passes. The position is strafed multiple times before an officer runs out into the open waving an identification panel. The US aircraft realise their mistake and peel off. Miraculously, no paratroopers are wounded or killed in the friendly fire incident. Despite this mishap, the return of Allied air supremacy is a welcome morale boost to the surrounded men at Bastogne. It also has the effect of keeping German artillery fire quiet for the rest of the week, with gun crews fearful of revealing their positions during the day. These actions are repeated across the entire front. More than 3,500 Allied aircraft take to the sky to pound German armoured columns and logistics. Half of the fighter bomber units are delegated to smashing the American advance on the Meuse River. The spearhead of the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich has been forced to halt after its supply train is disrupted by bombing. Just ahead of them is the crossroads at Barak de Freitur, which controls the highway from Liège to Bastogne. The furthest point of the German advance is now only 10 miles from the nearest Meuse river crossing. Holding this position is a mixture of units from the 82nd Airborne, the 106th Infantry and 7th Armoured Divisions, commanded by Major Arthur Parker. Parker has been ordered by the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, Major General Jim Gavin, to hold the crossroads at all costs. Despite limited artillery and armour support, Parker uses the excellent fields of fire at the crossroads to his full advantage. The first attack comes on the 21st of December, as a patrol from the 560th Volksgrenadier Division stumbles upon the position. Parker has his 50 caliber quadruple mount anti-aircraft half-tracks train their guns on the approaching enemy. The half-tracks, nicknamed meat choppers by the GIs, tear the enemy infantry to shreds as they approach the crossroads. The attacking German column numbers just 80 against his 300 men with half-track fire support. The Volksgrenadiers retreat in disarray after suffering heavy casualties at the cost of no Americans killed. The defenders capture an officer from the Das Reich division, alerting Parker that he is about to be attacked in force by panzers. The following morning, the enemy returns with much greater firepower. A German assault by the Volksgrenadiers is launched while Parker's men are eating breakfast. The attack is beaten off with help from the meat choppers, but Parker's men suffer heavy casualties. The US infantry's brown uniforms are easily visible against recently fallen snow, making the men easy targets for the enemy. At 3pm, the Germans launch another large attack. Following a preemptive artillery barrage, an entire regiment of SS Panzer Grenadiers, supported by two companies of tanks, advances up the road towards the defenders. During the battle, Parker is wounded and many of his men are forced to withdraw after running out of ammunition. At a roadblock to the north of the crossroads, glider troops from the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne are ordered to reinforce the endangered position to their south. They move towards Barak de Freitur with two platoons of Sherman tanks from the 3rd Armoured Division, rallying retreated American soldiers on the way to follow them back into the fight. The German troops are caught by surprise when the American reinforcements arrive. They had believed they were just about to clear the area of Allied forces. The glider infantry along with the Shermans push the SS Panzer Grenadiers and tanks back from the crossroads. The Americans dig in for another assault, now under the command of Major Elliot Goldstein. However, their reprieve doesn't last long when the Das Reich Division launches one final attack in the evening with every available unit. The Germans are desperate to break through and complete their dash to the Meuse before the end of the day. Before the assault, the German forces use captured radios to jam the wave band for American forward artillery observers. This time, 
The mixture of glider troops, infantry and armour can't hold back the enemy, which is now coming from the south. German panzers and a mounted 88mm flat gun knock out most of the Shermans and force many of the American infantrymen to fall back. Like the 101st Airborne Paratroopers outside of Foy, several men of the 325th Glider Regiment climb into shot-up Sherman tanks to fire back using the still operable main guns. Despite their heroics, the glider troops and infantry are slowly overwhelmed by 7.30pm. Major Goldstein orders his men to retreat north into the woods, but many are now besieged by the German forces in a nearby barn. The cattle within have been whipped into a frenzy by the battle, and a quick-thinking GI uses this to his advantage. The barn doors are opened and the cattle stampedes out, followed behind by the glider troops and infantry who run and fire at the enemy. In the confusion, three Shermans and fifty men manage to escape and reach friendly lines. Barrac de Freitur is known today as Parker's Crossroads. Despite the fall of the crossroads, the tide of the battle is turning. Aided by clear skies, Patton's counterattack is finally making progress towards Bastogne. The German northern shoulder, along with Kampfgruppe Piper, has been defeated. In Versailles, General Eisenhower is preparing a massive Allied counter-offensive to push the Wehrmacht back into Germany. The German panzer divisions try to press on to the Meuse River, but they have exhausted much of their offensive strength. Nevertheless, the Führer himself has ordered the river breached as soon as possible without regard for the condition of his soldiers. The armoured spearhead of the German offensive staggers forward, despite being short of ammunition and fuel. Unbeknownst to them, General Brian Horrocks's 30 Corps has reached the battlefield, and the guns of British artillery and Sherman fireflies are now trained on the advancing German tanks. The final battle for the Meuse crossings is about to begin. Thanks to kings and generals for this week's guest narration. On our sister channel, The Intel Reports, this week, we're looking at why the 101st Airborne remained adamant that they didn't need rescuing by Patton, despite being surrounded. See you next Friday in part 5, The Relief of Bastogne.